Let me Chairman say, Frank Pallone, just gaveling uh, in uh, the so afternoon much. session. You're like a hero, you really are. Or heroine, I guess is the word, huh? In that, I mean, I know that uh, you're, uh, I know, I don't know all the details, but I remember the speech when you came to the floor that one day and it was just amazing and all that you do, I don't know how you find the time, but thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm happy to bat clean up today for the uh, member panel and Chairman Pallone and uh, Ranking Member Deal when he comes back and the distinguished, mem distinguished members of the subcommittee that are, that are here with us. Um, it really is an honor to, to be here to testify uh, in front of the Health Subcommittee of Energy and Commerce. And Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for holding this hearing uh, during Breast, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I think that's um, a particularly important symbol. Um, it's fitting that we review what is needed in the fight against breast cancer um, during this special month when Although we pay special attention to breast cancer awareness during, during the month of October, it's important that we focus on that awareness and help women pay attention to their breast health throughout the year. And before I go further, I, I really want to give my deepest gratitude and thanks to the effort of three of my colleagues, Sue Myrick, uh, Rosa DeLauro, and Donna Christensen, who embraced this legislation months ago before I publicly shared my own battle with breast cancer. And it was an honor to testify by the side of my friend and colleague, Rosa DeLauro, and Sue, um, you are just superhuman. Um, I think there was one day when you got 40, 45 co-sponsors for this bill in one series of one small series of votes. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to express how much I appreciate your support for me and you know the fact that I was able to share my story and talk to you about our mutual experience before I uh, shared it with everyone else. Um, thank you very, very much. You've been there for me um, every step of the way. Uh, breast cancer strikes women from all backgrounds, all races, all ages, and all ethnicities. It strikes black and white, rich and poor, those with access to quality health care, and those without. But many women, too many women, do not know their specific risk, risk factors or their family history. And this is especially true with young women who see breast cancer as an older women's disease. Many young women think breast cancer will never happen before they turn 40. But we know that young women can and do get breast cancer. In fact, each year, nearly 24,000 women under 45 are diagnosed with breast cancer in the United States. While incidence rates of breast cancer are much lower in young women than older women, young women's breast cancers are generally more aggressive, they're diagnosed at a later stage, and they result in higher mortality rates. After talking with many healthcare professionals, advocates in the breast cancer community, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, it became clear that there was an urgent need to help build awareness among this often overlooked group. These conversations led to H.R. 1740, the Breast Health Education and Awareness Requires Learning Young Act, or the Early Act. This bill will empower young women to learn the facts, know their bodies, speak up for their health, and embrace support. The truth is we all need to be better informed about our own health. We must empower each other to know and reduce our risks. And recently, I learned I had more personal risk than I was aware of. Almost two years ago, as most of you know now, only six weeks after a clean mammogram, I found a lump in my breast while doing a routine self-exam. My doctor diagnosed me with breast cancer when I was only 41. As a legislator, I've been in the fight against breast cancer for a long time. In Florida, I was the lead sponsor of the drive through mastectomy law, the fo focus of Rosa's bill. I never dreamed I would need its protection myself. I thought I knew all of my risk factors. That's why I chose to perform self-exams and saw my doctor regularly. But after I was diagnosed, I learned I had more risk factors than I was aware of. I had no idea, for example, that as an Ashkenazi Jewish woman, I was five times more likely than the general population to have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation. I didn't know that that mutation gave me as much as an 85% chance of developing breast cancer during my lifetime. Too many young women are unaware of their risk. The Early Act will give all young women the tools and information they need to take control, more control, of their health. It will raise awareness of their personal risks and the importance of paying attention to their breast health. It will encourage young women to be familiar with the look and feel of their breasts. By knowing what feels no normal, a young woman has a better chance of knowing when something feels different. And I can tell you that that's how it was for me. Because I did self-exam on a fairly regular basis, I was familiar enough with what my breasts were normally felt like so that when I felt that lump, I knew it didn't belong there. The Early Act will teach young women and medical professionals about the importance of family history, 
warning signs of breast cancer, and predictive tools such as genetic testing that can help some high-risk women make informed decisions about their health. It will also provide grants to organizations dedicated to supporting young women diagnosed with breast cancer. These grants will help young women tackle the unique challenges that they face, like fertility preservation, body image, and self-esteem, as well as help them manage and understand their risks. And again, when a young woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, I mean, at 28 years old, for example, if they don't even have a boyfriend and they're faced with breast cancer and having a double mastectomy and dealing with chemo chemotherapy and facing their own mortality, on top of that, having to think about how to preserve their fertility, that is a unique challenge that young women who are diagnosed with breast cancer face that older women simply do not. And younger women have to face many more years as survivors, which, pre which presents itself, uh, in, in and of itself, unique challenges. So we have 371 co-sponsors in the House, including nearly all members of this subcommittee, and 30, 34 co-sponsors in the Senate. The Early Act has garnered broad public support from more than 40 advocacy and health organizations, many of whom whose representatives are behind me here today. And I just cannot thank these groups enough for their support, for their expertise and their guidance in helping to craft this legislation, but also for their personal support of me, because it is, uh, it's just been very moving and special for me. Some say that we shouldn't be talking to young women about breast cancer at all, because it might scare them. Well, I find this quite simply patronizing. Young women and providers can handle the truth. They can and should be empowered with the knowledge that while only 15 percent of breast cancer cases are in women under 45, eight of these women die every day here in America. Having no information when you're 35 about breast cancer and finding a lump in your breast, that is what is really scary. Over the past year, I've met with oncologists and other healthcare professionals that work with breast cancer patients, whether at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute at Harvard, or the Cancer Center at Memorial Regional Hospital in my district in Florida. The message is clear. Too often, a diagnosis of breast cancer is delayed or missed in young women. A Harvard study of young women with breast cancer found 26 percent delayed seeking medical attention and 27 percent experienced a delay in diagnosis after seeking medical attention. This means that more than half of young women are not receiving the timely treatment that they need. We must do better. By encouraging young women to know their bodies and their family history, and by teaching young women how to effectively talk with their doctors and their doctors with them, we can transform how we approach the fight against breast cancer. Every young woman that I know has the goal of becoming an old woman. With the passage of the Early Act, we can help more young women in America reach that goal and give them powerful tools to take control of their own health for a lifetime. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Really, you, you know, even now you give me a lot more insight into what needs to be done and, and, and what we need to do. And I, I just want to stress again, I know that there's been some discussion today about, um, you know, what's in the health care reform bill and how some of these bills relate and some parts of them actually are included. But uh, as I said earlier, this is a legislative hearing and so we do intend to move the bills. Um, and we'll look and see what's in, you know, the health reform and what isn't and, you know, take that all into account. So Mr. thank Chairman, you so much. Mr. Chairman, I've been a legislator for a long time. Any which way this bill becomes law is fine with me. <laughs> all right. Thanks <laughs> Thank you again. very much. And thank you to the committee staff because they've been an incredible so source of support and guidance as we've moved through the process too. Thank okay. you. Okay. Take care. Now what we're going to do um, with our uh, second and third panel is that the panelists have agreed, actually on their own initiative, to put the two panels together. So we're just going to have one panel. Uh, you know, this way we can save time and, uh, and, and have a series of questions that way. So I would ask the, the second and third panels to members to come forward if you would.
Well, welcome. Um, let me um, say that uh, you know the normal practice is that administration witnesses have a separate panel, which is why Dr. Taplin uh, from NIH would normally have had the second panel. So I just I want to thank you for for suggesting that uh, you be with the other panel, but I don't want anyone to think that that prejudices uh, what we do in the future. We understand that uh, that the administration um, is, you know, normally not part of a, another panel. So let me introduce uh, everyone. Starting on uh, my left is Dr. Stephen Taplin, who is Chief of the Applied Cancer Screening Research Branch, Division of Cancer Control and Population Science for the National Cancer Institute, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. Then we have Dr. Otis Webb Brawley, who is Chief Medical Officer for the American Cancer Society. Uh, Ms. Jenny Luray, who is President of the Susan G. Komen for the Cure Advocacy Alliance. Uh, Deborah L. Ness, who is President of the National Partnership for Women and Families. Uh, Dr. George W. Sledge, Jr., who is a Balve Professor of Oncology at Indiana University Medical Center and the Cancer Pavilion. Uh, Ms. Fran Visco, who is President of the National Breast Cancer Coalition. And finally, Dr. Marissa C. Weiss, who is president and founder of breastcancer.org. So thank you all for being here. And I think, you know, we, we have five-minute opening statements that become part of the record. I'd like you to try to keep your comments to the five minutes, if you could. And um, we may, you may get uh, questions from the uh, panel that you'd have to get back to later in writing, too, but we'd like you to try to answer the questions today. So we'll start with Dr. Taplin from NIH. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I've also provided a written document that elaborates on my testimony with greater detail. Um, as you've heard, I'm Dr. Stephen Taplin, the Chief of the Applied Cancer Research Branch at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, before coming to NCI, I spent 20 years as a practicing family physician while also managing an organized breast cancer screening program and conducting screening uh, research at Group Health Cooperative, an integrated health plan in, the, in Seattle, Washington. There's more than 50 years of research in breast cancer screening and treatment that is now having a positive impact on li the lives of women. Research shows that the breast cancer incidence increases markedly as women age. Re each year, among 100,000 women, 1 1.4 cancers are diagnosed in the age group 20 to 24. But as you can see here in Figure 1, the rate rises to a peak of 454 in women ages 75 to 79. The benefit of research for these women is that breast cancer death has fallen across all age groups since 1975. Since 1990, the rate of decline has accelerated and the annual percent reduction in mortality has been a fairly consistent 2 to 3 percent per year over the last 10 years. However, let me be clear that I understand it is not the research that changed their lives. It is the choices women are making and the changes in therapy that physicians are implementing that has had the impact. The key is those changes are guided by evidence from research. The mortality reduction we are seeing is due to both improvements in treatment and improvements in screening. An elegant set of modeling studies demonstrated approximately half the reduction in mortality among women ages greater than 40 is due to screening. That, in fact, screening has become a large part of health in the United States, since evidence from randomized trials showed that mortality reductions were possible. However, the integration of screening into care has not been simple because the evidence has, was sometimes ambiguous. The results from breast cancer screening trials show less benefit for women ages 40 to 49. Furthermore, the benefit appears much later in the lives of these women. Ultimately, however, the results of randomized trials led to national recommendations and increases in breast cancer screening among average risk women in the United States, beginning at age 40. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, as you've heard, suggests considering screening every one to two years starting at age 40. Screening rates are at about 66 percent within the last two years in the United States today. It is clear that not everyone is at average risk. As our knowledge of the genetic determinants of cancer has grown, there has been increased concern regarding the high-risk populations. The ACS has proposed recommendations that women at greater than 25 percent lifetime <coughs> risk for breast cancer should consider magnetic resonance imaging. This is about 1 to 2 percent of women. 
These recommendations are based on observational studies showing that technology has a higher sensitivity in breast dense, dense breast tissue. Unfortunately, it also shows more false, false positive tests that occur, than occur with mammography. We need national work to show that use of MRI in high-risk women actually affects mortality. NCI is sponsoring studies of how to reduce the false positive testing with MRI, but it continues to be a limitation. One approach would, around the problem is to examine biomarkers and biomarker profiles that may identify the lethal cancers or become a screening test. <clears throat> Access uh, across most races and ethnicities, including whites, women in lower socioeconomic groups are less likely to be screened, in large part because they do not have access to preventive care. People with less than 12 years of education are one of the groups in the United States who has, been, who has not seen a significant drop in breast cancer mortality. The Centers for Disease, Disease Control and Prevention has managed a program to encourage access to screening among low-income populations that is a step towards addressing access. Access to medical care is critical to screening because it is a process, not a test. The screening process has multiple steps as shown in Figure 2. And these steps are managed in clinical trials, but not necessarily in usual practice in the United States. Thank you, Otis. To achieve the full potential of screening in the United States, we must consider how to improve the entire process. We must also consider the effects of the process on all the women, even those who will not get cancer. Some have argued that healthy people should be very skeptical of screening because most people will not have cancer even with a positive test. Improving the screening process means finding better tests and better diagnostic procedures. NCI is re supporting research in key areas relevant to optimizing the screening process for breast cancer, including risk estimation using biomarkers and genetic profiles, comparative effectiveness studies to evaluate MRI, 3D ultrasound, and emerging technologies, and the comparison of alternative screening and diagnostic strategies. In closing, I want to emphasize three points that fewer women have died of breast cancer because research has led to progress in breast cancer screening and treatment, that the research provides evidence for women and their physicians to choose wisely among options they face, but it is their behavior that changes care and improves outcomes, and three, that we have much more research to do to understand the screening process, how to affect behavior, to identify biomarkers of risk, cancer progression, and treatment response, and to use all of this information to begin to personalize screening. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Dr. Taplin. Dr. Broly, I see your name tag says Brawler, but it's Broly, right? <laughs> it's Broly. It, it's correct on this. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, I'm Dr. Otis Brawley the Chief Medical Officer of the American Cancer Society. I am a medical oncologist by training and a practicing physician, and I'm Professor of Hematology, Medical Oncology, Medicine, and Epidemiology at Emory University. On behalf of the 11 million cancer patients and survivors in America today, the American Cancer Society thanks you for your continued leadership in the fight against cancer and commitment to enacting comprehensive health care reform this year. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to testify today on federal initiatives to help fight breast cancer in the United States. Dr. Taplin's uh, comments were quite wise, by the way. Breast cancer is an amazingly devastating disease. It's also a very complicated disease. And too often, we do a disservice to women who we want to help by simplifying the concepts of this disease with very simple messages sometimes simple messages that actually end up doing harm. This year, breast cancer will take the lives of approximately 40,000 women in the U.S. This is particularly disheartening because we know that if every woman had access to accurate information about the disease, good science-driven early detection and quality and timely treatment, more of them would survive this disease. Members of the committee today quoted a lot of American Cancer Society generated statistics. One statistic generated by the same ACS epidemiologist that I would like to quote is the fact that with half-hearted approaches to breast cancer from, two, from 1991 to 2005, 
55 to 60,000 women lives or deaths were averted. We averted 55 to 60,000 breast cancer deaths by really, in essence, half-heartedly approaching this disease and not getting serious about it. At a time when at least a third, uh, and indeed in the 1990s, perhaps 50% of women who should have been getting screened were not getting screened, and even today, a substantial number of women who were screened and found with an abnormality get less than good treatment for their disease. Unfortunately, you see, uh, not all women have access to adequate health coverage or the public health programs that have been proven to help save lives. The consequences can be devastating in terms of prognosis. My testimony today will highlight four priority areas that are essential to improve breast cancer outcomes in the U.S. Priority one, we must ensure access to quality health care for all Americans. Our current health care system fails to meet the needs of far too many people. Research has made clear that lack of health insurance can be deadly. Studies have documented that uninsured breast cancer patients are more likely to be diagnosed at a later stage of disease and have lower survival rates than women who are privately insured. That's a polite way of saying the uninsured are more likely to die. Uh, continued progress against breast cancer requires that we give all cancer patients an equal opportunity to battle this disease by making sure they have access to quality and timely medical care. Priority two, we need to ensure that we apply what we know about evidence-based prevention and early detection and make these services available to all Americans. Breast cancer is one of the few cancers that can be detected early through evidence-based screening tests. Absent these screenings, Women are at risk of being diagnosed at later stages of the disease when it is spread and become more difficult and more expensive to treat and chances of survival's, uh, survival drop precipitously. Now is the time to transform our current sick care system in the one that also focuses on prevention and wellness. This requires making evidence-based prevention and early detection services affordable and accessible to all populations. Ironically, not doing so increases our nation's overall health care costs. Priority three, clinical decisions must be patient-centered and made through strict, rational, and orthodox interpretation of the most current scientific evidence. This is particularly important in the context of a serious illness like breast cancer or any cancer. As, practic as practitioners, we need to strive to consistently do a better job of explaining the evidence and the options for screening, treatment, and care as understandably as possible to help patients make informed decisions together with their health care teams. Priority four. Finally, we must do a better job of addressing the health disparities that exist in our nation. Recent studies have shown differences in quality of care provided among certain populations that are particular concern. For example, Congresswoman Castor actually quoted a study that I published together with colleagues last year that showed that black women were five times more likely to experience huge delays in starting breast cancer treatment compared to white women. We also found that black women were significantly less likely to receive appropriate surgery. 7.5% of black women and 1.5% of white women with a locally staged, potentially curable breast cancer did not get breast surgery. Research completed by Halstead in 1903 that was not practiced in the year 2006. It's well documented that insurance status and poverty are principal determinants in cancer disparities. We simply must do a better job in providing access to appropriate early diagnosis and cancer treatment services for all women. In closing, it is gratifying that since 1990, we've been seeing a rise in the number of women surviving breast cancer each year. And as I said, 55 to 60,000 deaths averted. But that success is not enough. All women must have access to accurate information, existing and future early detecting meth methods, and quality treatment and care. The number of deaths averted if all women who should have gotten screened and should have gotten accurate diagnosis and should have gotten accurate treatment, the number of deaths averted would have easily doubled over that 55 to 60,000. 
The Society appreciates the leadership and commitment of the Energy and Commerce Committee in helping eliminate suffering from breast cancer through the work that will be described today and through health care reform. My colleagues at the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, ACS CAN, and I look forward to working with you as we look ahead to help create a world with less cancer. <clears throat> Thank you again for inviting me here today. I'd be happy to answer your questions, sir. Thank you, Dr. Brawley. Ms. It's Luray, right? Ms. Luray? Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the four breast cancer bills before your committee. My name is Jennifer Luray, and I am president of the Susan G. Komen for the Cure Advocacy Alliance and vice president of government affairs and public policy for Susan G. Komen for the Cure. This year marks the 25th anniversary of National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. It's an opportunity to reflect on what we have accomplished and to work even harder to fight the war on breast cancer. Before the nation celebrated breast cancer awareness, we practiced denial. We didn't talk about breast cancer, didn't understand it, did little to find out how to prevent and treat it. This was the world that Susan Coleman lived in when she heard those dreaded words at age, 80, at age 33 you have breast cancer. Her sister, Nancy Brinker, founded Susan G. Komen for the Cure, and a promise made between two sisters to end breast cancer forever has become the promise of millions. Thanks to events like the Race for the Cure, we have invested almost $1.5 billion in cutting-edge research and community programs and have pledged another $2 billion over the next decade. The Komen Advocacy Alliance, the sister organization that I am proud to lead, mobilizes a network of 250,000 advocates, men and women, at the state and national level to Im promote important policy change. Our promise is to leave few scientific opportunities or community needs untouched. Yet, to make the most of these investments, we need to first empower women to be advocates for their own health. Second, to expand access to health care. And third, to improve the quality of care that women receive. And we need the help of Congress to do that. That's why I'm so pleased to be here today, because each of these bills before the committee helps us to move closer to these goals. I'll first discuss the Breast Cancer Early Act, H.R. 1740. A Coleman motto is that information empowers women to be their own best advocates. Yet too many women don't receive information about breast cancer until their doctor recommends their first mammogram at age 40. And that's just too late for information. Each year, 25,000 women in this country under age 45 are diagnosed with breast cancer, and sadly, almost 3,000 under age 45 will die. That's approximately 10 percent of all breast cancer diagnoses this year, certainly not a trivial number. A carefully targeted, evidence-based public health effort will inform young women and, importantly, their providers that, unfortunately, breast cancer does occur in young women. It will help women to establish good lifelong breast health habits, like regular exercise, and to be empowered to seek care when they suspect that something is wrong. It will also prevent fewer young women with breast cancer from being overlooked by the medical system and left undiagnosed until their disease is tragically advanced. We have had an outpouring of support from young women around the country for this bill. We are working with the bill sponsor to ensure that funding for the Early Act won't come from existing funds for the CDC's breast and cervical cancer program. <clears throat> Let's now turn to the Breast, breast Cancer Patient Act, H.R. 1691. To be truly empowered, women also need the ability to impact decisions. That's why the Komen Advocacy Alliance has consistently supported this bill by Reps DeLauro and Barton. Decisions concerning a woman's care after a complicated medical procedure should be made between the woman and her doctor and not dictated by an insurance company. H.R. 995, the Mammogram and MRI Availability Act, introduced by Representative Nadler, brings us closer to the second goal I mentioned, which is expanding access to health care. At Coleman, we believe that all women should have access to recommended screenings, including cancer survivors who need follow-up testing and surveillance. 
guidelines recommended by the American Cancer Society and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network state that women at high risk should receive annual screening mammograms and an MRI every year. Importantly, women undergoing screening tests should do so in conjunction with their doctor. When we talk about improving access to care, we mean quality care for all women, our third goal. So we commend Congresswoman Castor and Congresswoman Christensen for their attention to the issue of disparities in breast cancer. Low-income women should have access to the same quality care as higher-income women so that they can benefit from the same positive outcomes. Improving the quality of cancer care across income, race, and ethnicity has long been a focus of Coleman. We recently joined with the American Society of Clinical Oncologists to collect data that can be used for quality improvement. This type of data collection is needed for any performance or quality-based payment system. In addition to these bills specific to breast cancer, we want to thank Congresswoman Capps for her leadership on two comprehensive cancer bills, one to revamp research and the other to improve care. The Coleman Advocacy Alliance also strongly supports the insurance reforms in H.R. 3200 that would prevent patients from being denied coverage due to pre-existing conditions, protect patients from high out-of-pocket costs, and dramatically improve access to mammograms. Before Congress reconvened this fall, we asked our advocates to share their personal experiences. Nearly 60,000 women and men from around the country contacted their representatives. Their heart-wrenching stories call out the need for health care reform. Breast cancer patients turned down for insurance, turned destitute after paying for their care, and turned sicker because they couldn't afford screening or treatment. In conclusion, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to testify before your committee. As we mark the 25th anniversary of National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we take a hard look at what we've accomplished and where we need to be. The stigma surrounding breast cancer in our country is largely gone, a fact that makes us the envy of women, women the world over. In the U.S., more women are being screened and living longer as a result, and we've made progress on key scientific fronts. Yet, if we are one day to end the suffering and death from breast cancer, we must continue to make investments across the entire cancer spectrum to prevent and better detect and treat the disease. And we must always trust the women to be our partners in this fight. Information empowers women to be their best advocates. We look forward to working with you and our partners in the cancer community as we continue this important race forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Ness. Good afternoon, Chairman Pallone, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the... Just to bring the mic a, a little closer, that's all. How's that? That's better. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. The National Partnership for Women and Families is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with more than three and a half decades of experience working on issues important to women and families. Over the years, we've brought together a wide range of consumer voices to push for health reform that would expand affordable coverage, help us get costs under control, improve quality, and reduce disparities. We are very pleased to support the efforts of this subcommittee to enact comprehensive health reform this year. This is truly a historic moment. For the first time in decades, Congress is poised to enact comprehensive reform that would vastly improve the lives and well-being of America's women and families. We are pleased to endorse H.R. 3200 for many reasons. It provides meaningful financial assistance to help low and moderate income families purchase insurance. It ensures adequate coverage and scope of benefits. It creates a health insurance exchange with strong patient protections. It prevents insurers from denying or dropping people from coverage because of their health status or raising rates based on gender. Very importantly, it charts a pathway for real delivery system reform. This pathway is key to ensuring that the reforms we, act, the reforms we enact today are meaningful and sustainable for the long haul. 
I believe H.R. 3200 lays the groundwork for a system that over time will deliver better care to patients and enable us to get more value for our health care dollars. It does this by shoring up primary care and encouraging better coordination through new payment models. And it creates the necessary foundation for those models through things like comparative effectiveness research, workforce development, better data collection, and quality measurement and improvement. It's the development and use of quality measures that I want to particularly focus on today, not just for breast cancer care, but for our system as a whole. The use of measures to generate performance information about provider performance is critical to getting us to a system that some, at some point delivers on the promise of the right care to the right patients at the right time for the right reasons. Without measurement, we can't know if the new models we're putting in place are actually resulting in better patient care. We can't assess whether we're really eliminating disparities. Without measurement, we can't tell if we're using our health care dollars effectively. We can't transition to a system that's based on value rather than volume. Without good measures and good measurement and the quality improvement that they enable, we simply cannot achieve the high quality, effective, and equitable care that patients need and deserve. Congresswoman Castor, you have clearly recognized the importance of measurement in your bill, H.R. 2279, and we applaud your commitment and leadership on women's health issues. We share your goals of rewarding value over volume, of incentivizing quality, of improving the patient's experience of care, and eliminating disparities. And we particularly appreciate the provisions of your bill that move us toward quality measurement and public reporting at the individual provider level, and that help us begin to align our payment system so that we have incentives that encourage better quality and, and, and practice that lives up to the best standards of care. These elements are essential to building a more effective delivery system, and they should be integral not just to care for breast cancer, but to the broader reforms that we all seek. We stand ready to work with you and your colleagues to implement a pathway for these reforms, but we also urge that we do this in a way that benefits all patients, no matter what their condition or diagnosis, and in ways that are going to generate accountability for all providers across all settings. It's this vision that led the National Partnership to work with the Stand for Quality Coalition, which is a broad group of about 200 healthcare stakeholders that include consumers, purchasers, and providers, to issue a set of recommendations that are now largely embodied in H.R. 3200. These recommendations call for a national comprehensive strategy that includes setting priorities for quality improvement and measurement, developing good measures and then endorsing and maintaining those measures as national standards, collecting and analyzing measurement data, and then using that data for quality improvement, for public reporting, and for payment. This broad coalition of stakeholders also called for a multi-stakeholder consultative process to provide input and make recommendations so that the implementation of this strategy would engage and reflect the perspectives of all of us who have a stake in health care. So in closing, I want to say how pleased we are that H.R. 3200 has incorporated these recommendations, and I thank the members of this subcommittee for their leadership in recognizing that a comprehensive quality strategy is the critical foundation for health reform that is meaningful, equitable, and sustainable over the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sledge? Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony today. <laughs> My name is Dr. George Sledge. I'm a medical oncologist from Indianapolis who specializes in the treatment of breast cancer. I also serve as professor of medicine at Indiana University's Simon Cancer Center and am president-elect of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. ASCO's mission is to ensure that the highest quality evidence-based care is delivered to all people with cancer during all stages of their disease. We're especially pleased to speak at today's hearing as it focuses on the cornerstones of ASCO's mission, cancer prevention, quality, access to care, and education. 
Many of us have been touched by breast cancer either personally or through family members or friends' experiences. <laughs> ASCO supports the underlying go goals of all four bills being discussed today, and we, ensure, we urge this committee to ensure the resulting legislation is, is grounded in sound scientific evidence. In today's testimony, I'll focus on three areas that span the continuum of cancer care, patient access to appropriate screening, patient education and public awareness, and quality measurement in cancer care. The first is patient access to appropriate screening. Studies have shown the value of cancer screening, particularly mammography in women over the age of 40. ASCO supports provisions that prohibit health plans from establishing policies or barriers to medically appropriate testing. While MRI is a highly sensitive test, we should not overlook the potential risk of overdiagnosis that lead to additional diagnostic tests, including biopsy. Tests and procedures cause, uh, cause anxiety and can lead to harms, so we should be very clear about the associated costs, risk, and benefits. The greatest utility for MRI appears to be for women who are at high risk for breast cancer, such as individuals who have a strong family history. For women at high risk, detection of abnormalities is less likely to result in false positive findings. However, all women undergoing screening MRI should be informed about the odds of false positive findings and the potential adverse consequences of those findings. The second issue I'll discuss is patient education and public awareness. With respect to educa educating young women on the causes and risk of breast cancer, such an endeavor course, must be evidence-based. An informed patient has a critical advantage in cancer care treatment, and the American Society of Clinical Oncology has directed considerable resources and expertise to informing patients through our cancer.net website. Finally, I would like to address quality measurement and reporting, which is at the very core of ASCO's mission. More than 500 oncology practices throughout the country participate in ASCO's Quality Oncology Practice Initiative, or COPI, a system for practicing oncologists to submit clinical data where practice-specific and comparative data reports are generated. COPI allows oncologists to systematically assess the quality of care they provide and engage in data-driven practice improvement activities. The majority of the 80 quality measurements in COPI are applicable to breast cancer patients, and 14 are specific to breast cancer treatment. COPI, together with the Breast Cancer Registry Pilot, made possible by generous support from the Susan G. Komen for the Cure, will provide tremendous insight into how breast cancer patients receive care, where improvements are needed, and strategies for breast cancer care. A project that tests well-designed quality measures in breast cancer would move the field forward. However, such a project must remain flexible, especially with respect to public reporting of quality information. Studies of quality performance suggest that the most important element is the very active measuring and sharing outcomes with physicians. Value-based purchasing that reduces payment for low-quality providers rather than rewarding high-quality providers may have the unintended consequence of further stressing systems that are already struggling. The development and testing of quality measures would benefit from ASCO's long history of work in this area. Some measures developed by ASCO have already been endorsed by the National Quality Forum. But the number of NQF endorsed measures for cancer is quite limited. Significant work will be required to expand this portfolio so that it includes the full range of measures required in H.R. 2279. ASCO would be delighted to provide its expertise in this area. In closing, ASCO appreciates the tremendous thought and attention the subcommittee and sponsors of the four bills have devoted to the care of women with breast cancer. We look forward to working with you and our partners throughout the cancer community to achieve the important goals set out in these bills. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sledge. Ms. Visco? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Pallone, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate very much the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the National Breast Cancer Coalition. I'm a 22-year breast cancer survivor. 
I was diagnosed when I was 39 years old. My son David was 14 months old. I was a partner in a law firm in Philadelphia. And I was fortunate, I became involved with a group of women who launched the National Breast Cancer Coalition. And I soon left my law practice to devote my life to our mission to eradicate breast cancer. We are a coalition of organizations from across the country. Our board of directors is a board of 25 of these organizations representing the diversity that is breast cancer, from the Women of Color Support Group to Nueva Vida, to the Alamo Breast Cancer Coalition, to the California Alliance of Breast Cancer Organizations. Our national grassroots network consists of representatives of many different organizations. We set priorities. We educate our members to understand the language and the concepts of science. We know that women are quite capable of understanding these issues, of accepting the truth, no matter how difficult that may be, and of speaking up for themselves. We critically analyze information. We critically analyze public policies before we set our priorities and before we take positions. And we have but one agenda, and that is to eradicate breast cancer. I know the committee today is focusing on a number of bills specific to breast cancer, and we've submitted analyses of some of those bills to members, and I will submit them for the record. But what I want to focus my remarks on today is our number one priority, and that is the bill that we believe will have the largest impact for all women at risk of and all women who have received a diagnosis of breast cancer, and that is guaranteed access to quality health care for all. We followed our process of research, of critical analysis. We spent several years educating our grassroots, looking at various health care systems, reading the literature, researching the system, and we developed our framework, which was submitted with our written testimony to support guarantee access for all, educated patient participation at all levels of the system, shared responsibility and benefits based on evidence. We strongly support comparative effectiveness research because we believe that it is necessary to help ensure quality and affordable health care for all. We need a high level of evidence for doctors and patients to choose which care is appropriate, for whom and under what circumstances. In addition, our framework calls for a significant number, and that's 25 percent, of educated patient and consumer members on all committees, commissions, and boards involved in health care, including those established to review and assess the best evidence-based treatment options. We commend the committee for its work on H.R. 3200, which achieves many of the benchmarks set forth in our framework, and we were pleased to endorse that bill, and we look forward to working with you to ensure that all individuals have access to the comprehensive quality care they deserve, quality care they need. Everyone should have access, and it must be affordable, not just for the federal budget, but to people. It must be affordable to individuals. We very much appreciate your interest and support of our shared goal to save lives and to end breast cancer. You have the power to make a real difference for all of us, and we know how complicated these issues are, how difficult your task is, we know how complex breast cancer is and how careful we all have to be to make certain that what we are doing is the right thing in terms of women's lives. There are too many unfortunate examples of policy, messaging, and beliefs that have taken hold when there was, in fact, no real evidence behind them, and these actions resulted in harm to women. My written testimony describes them, from bone marrow transplant to breast self-exam to hormone replacement therapy to the misuse of statistics by opponents to health care reform that are looking inappropriately at survival statistics that are outdated from different countries. All of that has been submitted with my written testimony. I know firsthand the horror of breast cancer, and I see that horror over and over again for too many women of all ages, all races, all walks of life. That is why we are so firmly committed to the evidence-based approaches, to our passionate 
commitment to eradicating breast cancer. I want to take a moment to talk about Carolina Henestrosa, a strong, passionate, unbelievable activist. She was the executive vice president of the National Breast Cancer Coalition. She founded Nueva Vida, a national support group for women, uh, Hispanic women with breast cancer. She was diagnosed 15 years ago at the age of 35, and then again six years ago. She died in June of a soft tissue sarcoma, a result of her treatment for breast cancer. Not breast cancer, her treatment for breast cancer. Just one more story of how complex this disease is, how complicated the issues are. I dedicate my testimony and my work to her memory, and I thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Visco. Dr. Weiss. Thank you, Chairman Pallone, subcommittee members, and other panelists. It's a true privilege for me to be here today to talk about breast health and breast cancer, issues that have been my core professional focus and driving mission for over 20 years. But more importantly, these issues directly affect about half the United States population and the rest of us who care for them. My name is Dr. Marisa Weiss. I'm a breast oncologist and founder and president of the nonprofit BreastCancer.org. We're the world's most utilized online resource for breast health and breast cancer information, reaching 8 million people annually. As a doctor, I've had the honor of taking care of thousands of women with breast cancer and have seen up close its devastating effects. And our laws govern how I can best care for the unique needs of each individual that comes to me. Everyone here knows how much is at stake. The breasts are the favorite place for cancer to occur in women, often in the prime of their lives and when these women are most indispensable to so many. The bills before the committee today represent critical ongoing efforts to improve diagnosis and patient care. I'd like to start with the early act. I believe this legislation will do much to advance public health efforts and combat the threat of breast cancer, and I commend Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz for her leadership. There are concerns that outreach to young women will, con will produce more harm than good by creating the fear of breast cancer. But what we've found is that fear already widely exists. Information about breast cancer is pervasive. Young women, like the rest of us, are bombarded by breast cancer messaging aimed at adult women. To better understand the impact, BreastCancer.org conducted a research project with 3,000 girls ages 8 to 18 across the country. Consistently, nearly 30% of girls had already feared that they may have had breast cancer. It was triggered by a breast pain, a diagnosis in someone close to them, or mistaking the changes of normal breast development for signs of breast cancer. Over 70% of girls have someone close to them who's been diagnosed, a mother, grandmother, best friend's mom, teacher, or neighbor, and when breast cancer diagnosis strikes this close to home, their fears were magnified. Many young women think breast cancer messages in the media targeted to mature women directly apply to them as well, but they simply don't have the resources to understand the meaning and relevance of these critical issues, nor do they have the dialogue skills or opportunities to discuss their fears or clarify breast cancer misinformation. Only 47% of the girls had talked to a parent, 40% to a doctor. To resolve unrealistic fears, young women in this era need accurate information and reassurance that's age appropriate and scientifically grounded. Education can arm them with the facts in form of what's normal and what's not, empower them to take charge of their breast health. It is these girls during the ages of 8 to 18 and into their 20s that are using what they eat, what they drink, what they breathe in, medicines they take, personal products that they use to build their breast tissue, laying down the foundation of their future breast health. It is at this early point also that young women are establishing their lifelong behavioral patterns. Concerns have been raised about the value of education, outreach to low-risk populations, and the absence of modifiable risk factors. And we know how complex a disease breast cancer is with multiple causes. But most of these risks for breast cancer don't begin at age 45, Rather, they accumulate over a lifetime, beginning at conception. There are periods when breast cells are hypersensitive to internal and external environmental insults. The first trimester of pregnancy, the four to ten main years of breast organogenesis between adolescence and the 20s, as well as the stretch of time leading up to a woman's first full-term pregnancy when breast cells are highly active and immature. 
So the behaviors of women under age 45 impact not only their own breast health, but the future breast health of their daughters through pregnancy and model behaviors. Some risks are modifiable and some are not, but even the tiny risks can combine and really add up, particularly during these sensitive times. An example of a modifiable risk factor is the obesity epidemic across the United States associated with an increase in risk of breast cancer in adult women. Extra fat makes extra hormones that could stimulate extra breast cell growth. In addition, fat stores hormonally active pollutants that are lipophilic, such as bisphenol A, atrazine, dioxins, nonalphenols, which could potentially stimulate un unhealthy breast cell growth. And moreover, obesity in childhood predicts for obesity in adults, and obese mothers are more likely to raise obese daughters. And contrary to the claim that proven breast cancer risks can't be modified, our obesity epidemic is doing just that by accelerating the age of menarche. Early education and behavioral modification that increases athletic activity and healthy weight management early enough could postpone the onset of puberty. And lessons learned from the early act programs will benefit current and future generations since it's the women under the age of 45 who are in their prime childbearing and parenting years. Another example is the opportunity to provide breast cancer risk reduction strategies to high-risk women. In the early act, the 5 to 10 percent of breast cancers due to an inherited breast cancer genetic abnormality, over 13,000 per year, would more likely be identified, giving these women a greater chance to reduce the risk of breast cancer by as much as 90 percent with prophylactic mastectomies or 50 percent with anti-estrogen therapies. It's important that we impart this knowledge, along with what we, the scientific and medical community, know are not risk factors for breast cancer. Fear certainly breeds myths. And in our survey, many young women believe that only their mother's family history is important and that breast cancer skips generations. They also were fearful that they could have caught breast cancer from their mothers during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Education can change attitudes, knowledge, and behaviors. We do a disservice to this and future generations by neglecting to provide this information and facilitate this dialogue. I'm also here today in full support of the Breast Cancer Patient Protection Act, the Mammogram and MRI Availability Act, and eliminating disparities in breast cancer treatment. I'm prepared to answer any questions about the medical content. And in conclusion, I thank the chairman, the subcommittee, and the panel for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Now we'll have questions from the uh, members, and I'll start myself. Um, and I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Taplin uh, some questions initially. In fiscal year 2007, the National Cancer Institute invested nearly $600 million in breast cancer research. I understand the Institute devoted roughly the same amount of resources towards research on this topic in 2008. Can you describe, Dr. Taplin, the activities that NIH is supporting to understand how women can actually prevent, prevent breast cancer in the first place, and how is NIH investing in research into improved breast cancer screening as well as in tr into treatment of breast cancer once it's been diagnosed? In f less than two minutes, no. <laughs> whatever you can do. There are, there are many studies. Uh, related to breast cancer at NCI, as you've already noted, uh, we had $572.6 million and 2,146 studies at NCI in FY 2008. Those are concentrated in several areas, but the ones relevant to your question are prevention, uh, early detection, and treatment. We spent approximately $24 million or $27 million on prevention, $54 million on early detection, and $169 million on treatment studies. So all of those are relevant to, to your question. I think the, probably the most interesting piece, and there are several and many places we can go among the 2,146 studies we did, the most important, I think, is the Breast Cancer and Environmental Research Act, uh, which, which came from you folks and resulted in a, a center, a set of centers to look at uh, basic, uh, the relationship between environment and biology of young women's breast development. And so there are biologic studies in women, there's epidemiology study in, in uh, young women, and there's also a group of people looking, academic, academicians and educators, looking at how you communicate these issues to women and to young women especially, so that we can begin to adapt those messages to the population that we're targeting. Those are, those are some of the areas we're working. All right, thank you. Dr. Broly, I wanted to ask you um, 
The, the U.S. Preventative Task Force recommends that women over 40 have annual or biannual mammograms. Your organization recommends annual mammograms for women over 40 and clinical breast examinations for women in their 20s or 30s. So unless a woman uh, under 40 has an identified risk factor, there is no recommendation that she get a mammogram. I, I, obviously, you know, this relates to, to uh, Congresswoman Westerman Schultz's legislation. Would you elaborate on, you know, the, the challenges for women under 40 and what can, be, what can we do for these women to detect their cancers as early as feasible? Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. Part of the answer to your question is mammography is a terrible test for women who have younger breasts and denser breasts. It's a terrible test for two reasons. Number one, it's very difficult for the radiologist to actually make an interpretation of that x-ray because of the breast density. And number two, radiation does cause some cancers. And it causes cancers in younger breasts that are more active in terms of biology. So if you actually were to give radiation to the breasts of, say, 10,000 women who are under the age of 20 and do it on an annual rate, there are some people here, I'm not one of them, but they can calculate how many breast cancers we will ultimately manufacture. Okay? Now, in randomized clinical trials of women who are older in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, we have evidence that mammography clearly saves lives in screening. So what we like to do is if a woman has a mass and she's in her 20s or 30s, if she finds the mass or someone finds it on clinical exam, a, a clinician, uh, be it a nurse practitioner or a physician, then perhaps doing a mammogram is appropriate in that one particular individual. If you have someone who's at very high risk, perhaps the mammogram is appropriate or perhaps an MRI is. But to do mammography, mass mammography in the United States in younger women would be literally public health uh, malpractice because we would actually start manufacturing some breast cancers. Okay. I was going to ask the third question, but I, I, I don't have that much time left, so I'll move to other members. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingry. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I, I'll, I'll ask all of the, of the panelists, and I thank you for, for being here. Uh, same question and start with Dr. Uh, Taplin. Some have said that this bill uh, will spread fear of breast cancer among women who shouldn't be concerned at such a young stage of their life. As a physician, I believe that arming patients with medical information is good practice. As long as the message is, of course, well crafted and well delivered, do you see, do you have uh, any concerns that, that keeping this demographic well informed will ca cause more harm than good? It's an excellent question. I think the problem is that we don't have the evidence to give you the answer. The problem is that there is some evidence out there that there's a U-shaped curve, that there's, a, there's a, a perfect amount of fear. A little bit of fear may be helpful. A little bit too much fear may be harmful. And we don't really know where the balance is between those two things. And we don't know enough about messaging, from my standpoint, to, to know what the answer is to the question you're posing. So that's part of why we're sponsoring the, uh, the studies that I've already mentioned. Dr. Braley. Uh, Dr. Gingrey, part of the American Cancer Society's early concern about this bill was that it wasn't clear who was going to create the messages that were going to be conveyed to the population. Now that it's very clear that a committee of scientists appointed by the director of the CDC will be those that craft the messages that should be conveyed, we feel very comfortable with educating the population because we have some, we have some assurances that the messages will be created by experts. So, yes, I'm agreeing with you, and I think that the messages that would be conveyed through the early act would be messages that would be scientifically valid. Now, you are correct that the uh, messaging to individuals, be they youth or be they people in their 50s, is sort of like a T1 line. The more health messages that you put forth, you diminish all the other health messages. Uh, the, currently, the early act, as I see it, allows for messages about diet, health messages about exercise and nutrition, and actually may be more, more than a breast health act, 
much more a health act because it's going to, if, if the messages are received appropriately, it's going to prevent diabetes and heart disease, which actually, by the way, kill more people in their 30s, the 30s and 40s, yeah. females in their 30s and 40s, than breast cancer. Ms. LeRae? Yes, and we agree with Dr. Brawley. Um, we're pleased how the bill has evolved over time. One study of young uh, survivors found that 40 percent didn't believe that young women could even get breast cancer. So part of what we're looking for is a very targeted campaign that lets women know that while it's a very small risk, it is possible so that if they feel that lump, they don't ignore it. Or if they go into their doctor's office and they say, we, I feel like I have a lump, and the doctor says, oh, it's just dense breast tissue, don't worry about it, they can pursue their concern. And again, based on factual information uh, pulled together by the appropriate uh, sources. Yeah, thank you. Ms. Ness? I'll just reinforce um, what my colleagues here have said. I think we can't underscore enough the importance of basing what we do on evidence. And we need the research to tell us what makes sense, both in terms of medical practice, but also in terms of how we educate and increase awareness. Okay. And Dr. Sledge. Well, I, I think we all agree that knowledge is power, but it, it's only powerful to the degree to which it's accurate and we can act on it. And I, I think careful evidence-based data is actionable. The, the problem in younger women, is, to be honest, is that a lot of, of what we don't know exceeds what we do know in terms of uh, prevention for early women, in terms of early diagnosis, and in terms of what are, are the right health habits for these women. Uh, so uh, I think physicians uh, and all of us uh, need to be very careful about pretending more than we currently know. Okay, uh, Ms. Visco. Well, I couldn't have said it better than Dr. Sledge did. I think um, it is very important that messages that we give out are based on evidence, that they're factually correct, and that there's something you can actually do about that information. But I want to make clear that the evidence of harms that um, some people are concerned about, and we're concerned about certainly with giving messages about breast cancer to millions and millions of healthy women, the vast, vast majority of whom will never get breast cancer, is also the distinct and clear possibility that has been shown in um, clinical trials of um, unnecessary biopsies, that people, young women are going to feel things in their breasts, they're going to have biopsies. Those biopsies can result in infections and in further harm. So it's not just the issue of anxiety. That's why it's so incredibly complex. Dr. Weiss, before you respond, and as a, as a breast cancer surgeon and having treated many, many patients, uh, how young do you think we, we really should give this information to young women? At what age do you, you start doing that? Um, well, this information becomes, it's important to deliver it when it's most relevant. And we find that girls are going through puberty earlier and earlier these days, and their breasts are very much on their minds. Um, I think the power of education is not just delivering uh, you know, education along the way, but correcting this uh, mass of misinformation that's out there. Our surveys have shown that over 20 percent of girls think that antiperspirant use, getting bumped in the breasts, infection, drug use, drinking coffee, wearing a bra, an underwire bra, increase the risk of breast cancer, and without the correct information that, we, that is well established today. So I do think that when you replace myths with facts, that you do free these girls of some of the anxiety they have about growing up and going from a big girl to a young woman and a young woman to a mature woman. And I think that that is going to um, make them more engaged in a proactive, in proactive healthy behaviors through their life. And while they're in high school and college, they're in institutional, educational institutions. They're within a system yeah. where knowledge delivery so, is. So <coughs> education, educating them as teenagers, but not necessarily preteens. Well, we have found that a lot of misinformation, fears, and questions present themselves upon adolescence. And whether or not you want to go back that early is a question that has to be studied. But those questions certainly exist. Yeah. And they are inadequately addressed right now in current health classes within middle school, high schools. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And thank all the panelists. I appreciate your response. Thank you. Ms. Castor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all. Your testimony was very insightful, everyone. Uh, 
Ms. Lurie, I'd like to I'd like to thank you and uh, the Susan G. Komen for the Cure Advocacy Alliance for extending uh, your support to my Eliminating Disparities in Breast Cancer Act since it was first introduced uh, last Congress. And I'd like to return the thanks and commend you all for everything that you've done to raise awareness about disparities in access, uh, access to screening, access to quality care and treatment. Uh, the work you've done both with the American Society of Clinical Oncologists and with the Metropolitan Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force to reduce disparities is very commendable. Uh, could you discuss what you believe we can do further uh, to educate women about the types of treatment that they should look to receive after diagnosis so that women are not in the dark and are empowered to take control of their health and diagnosis? And please explain how moving forward uh, towards re rewarding providers for quality care and ensuring that providers are not rewarded for inadequate care will help to reduce uh, disparities in treatment. Thank you, Congresswoman, and we appreciate your leadership as well. I'd like to take a minute just to talk briefly about our partnership with the Metropolitan Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force because I think it's partnerships like this that will give us the data that then can be modeled by um, other community-based programs to promote the type of quality breast cancer care you're talking about across uh, income and racial and ethnic lines. Um, in, Ch in Chicago, the breast cancer mortality rate for African, African Americans is even worse than in the rest of the country. Uh, African American women in Chicago have a 68 percent higher uh, mortality rate than white women do. And the task force that we are involved in and, and are supporting developed an action plan for three main causes of the disparity. And it's almost like a, a tragic Rube Goldberg um, image because, first of all, they have to get access to the mammography. And that's either physical, where is it, how do you get there, and economic, can they afford it? But then they have to make sure that it's of poor quality. And we, as providers and advocates, need to make sure that that, that mammography is of, of high quality. And then they have inadequate access to treatment. And then you have to ask the same questions about their treatment. Is the treatment that they're getting at the same level of evidence and the same level of quality that higher income women are getting? Um, so again, th there are so many barriers uh, that need to be addressed in terms of ensuring that, uh, there, that this disparity in care does not continue um, in communities. And, but we're very hopeful that what we're doing in Chicago and what we're funding in communities across the country can help um, to promote a, a very high quality breast cancer uh, treatment program. Have you targeted other communities besides Chicago? Yes, we have, and I'd be happy to share that information with your staff. Terrific. Uh, the American Cancer Society found in 2007 that certain additional screenings after diagnosis and initial treatment are not equally administered among patients, particularly tests to ensure that cancer has not spread to nearby lymph nodes. Maybe, uh, Dr. Brawley, you, can you share with us, uh, have you found that additional screenings after treatment that are considered essential are not always accessible? I think you testified to that account. Yes, uh, ma'am. And what, to what do you think that we can attribute the fact that some providers simply are not universally screening patients for potential spread of their cancer to other areas of the body? I think the, likely, the likelihood, I don't have a study that I can quote for you, but I can tell you as someone who's practiced medicine, the likelihood is that there can be a couple of different reasons. And what we're talking about here is um, follow-up exams after treatment uh, uh, to see if the disease has come back. Uh, the, uh, sometimes the physicians simply forget, which is unfortunate upon the part of the physicians. Sometimes the patients are advised to get the test or it's prescribed and they don't go and get the test. Uh, sometimes, and this is the more common problem, there's an affordability problem, co-pays and other things that uh, people are just unable to come up with, even if in short. And I, I'm actually much more concerned very frequently about the insured individual who doesn't have very good insurance than even the uninsured individual, because quite a few people 
today, I just saw a figure more than 60% of personal bankruptcies are due to health care costs. Quite a few individuals with breast cancer who need to get a chest x-ray or even just simple liver function test that might cost $80 simply can't afford the continued co-pays over time so they don't get those therapies. Thank you. Gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before I begin, if I could ask unanimous consent to enter into the record um, testimony from Lifetime Networks. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. And before I turn to the panel, um, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I'd also just like to recognize Kathy and Lee Giller, who are here from Akron, Ohio, uh, my district, and they're in town for the three-day uh, Susan G. Conan walk, and um, Kathy was the number one fundraiser from Cleveland this year, and we are uh, proud to have her here with us. <clears throat> As for the panel, thank you very, very much for, uh, for your testimony, and it's hard to sit here without thinking about um, the people that we have known in our lives who have suffered from breast cancer, some who have been lost, some who are fighting the fight now, and of course wondering about those who may encounter this battle in the future. Um, several of you in your remarks and in your testimony, you stress the need for the access to quality affordable health care. Um, Ms. Visco, you talk about quality affordable health care for all. I appreciate that and I concur. Um, Dr. Brawley, you also uh, talked a, a lot about the, the need to get health care uh, for women. And Dr. Weiss, one of the things that you said that was striking to me and I think is important is you talked about the unique needs of patients because not always is, uh, does one size fit all in, uh, on, on this issue. And as I sit here, one of the, the people who comes to mind was a woman who I knew 10 years ago. Um, when I was working on these issues in the state legislature. And her name was Linda. She had breast cancer. Her mother had had breast cancer. Her uh, aunt, it was, it was very pervasive in her family. Um, her doctor wanted to treat her aggressively because of the family history. Um, a, a doctor attached to an institution that is of high uh, renown when it comes to treatment, and the insurance company said no. We're not going to pay for a coverage of that treatment. Her treatment was delayed because she had to raise money for the treatment. She ultimately succumbed to uh, cancer. Um, I went to her funeral and I listened to her young daughter get up and give a report about an essay that she wrote in school about how her mom was her hero because not only did she fight against breast cancer, she fought against the insurance companies to try and make things better for other people in the future. So. My question, I guess, is that was a decade ago. Is that better? Is it better now? Is, is, are the treatments that you're, you know, the doctor is, is asking for, are, are they covered? Dr. Brawley, would you like to? Yeah, I, I get in trouble for just saying the flat out truth. There have been instances where the insurance companies have been wrong, and there have been instances where the patients have been wrong, and there have been instances where physicians have been wrong. Ms. Visco uh, talked about bone marrow transplant for breast cancer. Uh, very quickly, the thumbnail history of that. In the early 1990s, many people thought high-dose chemotherapy with bone marrow transplant would be beneficial for women at high risk for relapse of breast cancer. Uh, many hospitals started these bone marrow transplant programs as a way of making money. Ten state legislatures passed laws saying that insurance companies had to pay for them. Many women sued their insurance companies because they didn't want to pay for it. There was no scientific evidence to support it. Ultimately, this delayed the NCI studies that ultimately showed that bone marrow transplant in breast cancer was more harmful than helpful. This is when people stop being scientific and start practicing you know, earlier I said in my statement that one of the problems with this disease is it's a complex disease and we all want to make it very simple and we all want to have very simple messages. That's a darn good example of how the simple message, more chemotherapy must be better, mm -hmm. actually killed women. It wasn't that it was just a waste of money. It actually killed women. 
I appreciate your answer, and I think that again goes back to the point of of it isn't simple. It's all very um, multifaceted, and and there are unique considerations in every story, right? So it's very well, difficult yeah, to. But, uh, yeah. but Congresswoman Sutton, the answer to your question is what what you described does happen, where people want to get. Yeah. The right therapy, and someone, an insurance company or others, somehow decide that they should not get the right therapy. That does happen. It's one thing to make a determination based on health needs, and it's another thing to make a determination based on money. So, okay. and <clears throat> Congresswoman, if I may add, there's the issue of access to experimental treatments and how that access is granted, and whether or not it's based on scientific evidence. But there's also access to um, ongoing treatment. Uh, that many of our patients experience. There was a young woman here, uh, Anna Van Leer, um, who had to fight her insurer after being diagnosed with breast cancer, had to fight to get her MRI um, because of her age. And that occurs again and again. So it's, it's, it, the experimental treatments are one issue, but it's right. the ongoing need for surveillance, care, um, side effects, et cetera, and having to battle the, in, the insurer um, every day. Thank you. And, and of course, the economic loss that they experience, too, because of the high out-of-pocket Thank you. Dr. Weiss? Well, I mean, the cost of negotiating with the insurance companies throughout each clinical day has lengthened my day by two hours. And it has slowed down the urgent feeling of patient, you know, her, her ability to get what she needs when she needs it. And we start, you know, we've doubled our office staff just to get enough people on the phones to get the authorizations for a test or for a treatment or to see no doctor or to, to clarify, get a second opinion and maybe even a third opinion in a complex case. So in terms of the cost of health care, I don't think that these barriers are saving us money. I think that we need these laws today to give the physicians the ability to, de to deliver the optimal care in terms of early detection, treatment, and surveillance of women beyond their initial treatment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this gentleman from uh, Iowa, Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Brawley, I want to follow up with your observation because you might find it interesting to note that I used the exact example that you were describing in an earlier markup we were having on health care in the same conference room. And one of the things we can't ignore is sometimes the political implications of important public policy decisions we're making that involve academic research, scientific research, medical research, and most importantly, people. Because the story I used was from a book called, um, um, it's written by Shannon Brownlee, it's given to me by a family practice doctor. Over, over treatment. And this exact scenario that you were describing is mentioned at length in that book. And this very conference room was filled with women who were getting high dose chemotherapy with bone marrow transplants. And the person who developed that treatment methodology was sitting in these witness chairs and turned with his back to members of Congress and had all those women stand up and then said to the members sitting in this hearing room, 50% of these women will be dead if you don't approve funding for this treatment. So we're really talking about a high stakes poker game here. And I think what all of us want to get to is a healthcare delivery system that is based upon evidence-based decision making that makes sense for the greatest portion of the population. Um, I had the opportunity before I came to Congress to represent a retired swimming coach who was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and the treatment of choice that he decided upon was not covered by Blue Cross Blue Shield through an employee-sponsored health care plan. And after a lot of research and investigation, we determined that Blue Cross Blue Shield was also the administrator for Medicare in the state of Iowa and covered that form of treatment as non-experimental. So when we're talking about making health care available to women who've been diagnosed with breast cancer, we all need to know the best evidence available, so, and we also need to eliminate these bizarre distinctions between coverage options so that no woman who is a breast cancer, who's been diagnosed with breast cancer, is faced with the difficult decision of deciding how she's going to pay for treatment under one program 
that she could get if she was old enough to be covered under Medicare or something else. And so one of the things I'd like to ask the panel about is why this particular class of women, younger women who do not fit what traditional theories of who is most likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer, why are they more vulnerable than other segments of the population, if they are, and what types of attitudes do they bring to their treatment that make them more challenging as a group, if they are, than other groups of women? If I could start first, sir. And thank you. I, I truly do believe that adequate health care reform includes a reforming how we consume health care. We have to all learn to be more scientific and appreciate the science and the evidence. One aspect of the early bill, uh, which uh, I think is important, is it actually puts aside some money to address the very questions that you just addressed. What's different about younger women? How can we help younger women who have this disease? And that's actually the mo some of the most important parts of the early bill. The ACS had some difficulty with the bill early on because some of the messages that were in it were not messages that we thought we could support. We wanted evidence-based good messages. Now we have scientists and survivors in a committee coming up with what the, what the evidence-based messages should be. But one thing this bill always had was research to look at the quality of life needs of women with breast cancer, women who have been diagnosed who are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And that's always been a very good part of this bill. Yes. So I would say that um, we don't know very much about breast cancer in any age group. Um, there are uh, some data that younger women are more likely to be diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, or a specific type of breast cancer, for which we have treatments for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer that work well. We have treatments for HER2 overexpressing breast cancer that works well. For triple negative, we don't yet have targeted therapies that work well. So uh, more research into looking at that type of breast cancer, although there are a number of new possibilities in clinical trials now. There's also the issue of fertility. I was 39 when I was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. I had chemotherapy. I did go into premature menopause. I wasn't, didn't have the opportunity to have more children. But there are side effects with treatment no matter how old you are. That is a side effect of treatment for younger women. It is something we need to do more research on. But we just don't have the information. We, we just don't know enough about breast cancer, and certainly not enough about breast cancer in younger women. So I, I can only add a little, uh, but these women are, are, are vulnerable in, in many ways. One is they're, as, uh, doc, uh, as uh, Fran has just mentioned, they're biologically vulnerable. They, they tend to have much more aggressive cancers than do older women. Mm -hmm. Cancers that grow rapidly, cancers that are more likely to spread to other parts uh, of the body at a, at a more uh, uh, earlier point in time. Cancers that are less targetable in terms of hormonal therapy or, or HER2 targeted therapy, so they're, so they're biologically vulnerable. They're economically vulnerable. Uh, these are women who, by and large, uh, are less likely to have insurance just because they're at an earlier point in their life and they're not as far, far along up the chain that would allow them to have a, a good, a good health care uh, uh, ability to, to uh, cushion in, any, any blows. Economically, they can't cushion the blows because, because they don't have any money in the bank. Socially, they're vulnerable because they have perhaps have just started their family or have just gotten, gotten married. Uh, they have to worry about these fertility issues that, that a woman who's 20 or 30 years older would not have to worry about. So across the board, they're, uh, Congressman, they're, they're far more vulnerable uh, than our older patients. Are the criteria that the AJCC staging manual is using for breast cancer adequate to try to delineate any of these specific concerns that you've mentioned here today? Or they, are they using broad groupings of women that don't allow us to have that, uh, the ability to drill down and, and define criteria that would be more age appropriate for different segments of the population? Sir, I can only give my opinion as a physician who treats breast cancer patients. 
Uh, I think the HACC, uh, which does the staging manual, has done a good job, although it is actually being reevaluated right now as we speak. I think one of the great problems we have in breast cancer is our definition of what cancer is actually comes from some German pathologists in the 1840s. And we have not actually brought cancer, the definition of cancer, into a molecular or genetic age. We're still using the same science, looking at it under a microscope with a glass to say this is cancer, that we used 160 years ago. And one of the challenges to us in science is to find a genetic way to look at a tissue and say that this particular tissue in this woman's breast is going to behave in, in this particular way over the next 20, 30, 40 years. And that's how we ought to treat it. This particular tissue is going to be very aggressive, so we need to treat it aggressively. This other woman's breast cancer is going to be less aggressive, so we'll treat it or maybe even watch it and be less aggressive. We've not gotten there, but that's where hopefully the science is going to take us. That's hopefully where the sequencing of the human mm -hmm. genome is going to take us. And maybe 20 years from now, uh, we'll be talking about those tests. Thank you. I would just also add that in, in the care of any woman, who has been diagnosed with breast cancer, who is also a mother, one of her biggest concerns is, what does my diagnosis mean for the women in my family? And that, that question comes up all the time. And so that is an area of research that I know we are all involved in that deserves much better answers. Because if, if you don't deal with that profound fear and concern for her, you haven't really taken care of the whole woman or her whole family. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, I know it's been a long day and we had to delay and have votes and all that, but I thank you for bearing with us. And this was very enlightening in terms of the whole issue. Um, as I said earlier, we, this was a legislative hearing, so we're going to have to sift through all this and figure out what's in the health care reform and what isn't. And, but we do intend to uh, try to move the bills uh, that, that were uh, considered today. Um, and let me just mention that members can still submit written questions to you. They, they're supposed to submit them within 10 days and then the clerk notifies you. So we may ask you to respond in writing to uh, some additional questions. But thanks again and without objection, this meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned.
Now on C-SPAN 3, we join a Senate hearing live in progress on preparations for the 2010 census. The count mandated by the Constitution is expected to cost...